the Olympics, did the Irish do it first? Yep, that's really what we're going to talk about. As you know, with my videos, I try to connect you to the ancientness of Irish culture to make your trip that much more interesting. And today we're going to do that by talking about the Taltian Games, also known as the Irish Olympics. And we'll do all of that as we're walking down to the seashore, past an old holy well. So if that sounds interesting to you, then let's get into it. So what are the Teltian Games and how old were they really? And did the Greeks actually got their idea of the Olympics from the ancient Irish? We'll go into all of that. Just on the surface, you might think, you know what, the Teltian Games, that's a very insular subject. Why would I care? But the moment that you dive into it, you start to understand that there are so many of these great little touch points that you become familiar with for your trip to Ireland. You've already heard in that case of things like a Tua de Dana or of the ancient god Lu or the importance of fosterage. So learning about this particular subject just gives you a little leg up. All right, enough waffling about, let's get into it. The Teltian Games, they were a celebration of Irish culture and strength. Uh, it's a place where people came together from all over the islands to trade, to make contracts and to celebrate a harvest. So every year these games were held and there would be competitions of hurling, spear throwing, chariot and horse racing, things like the long jump, the high jump, running, boxing, sword fighting, uh, archery, wrestling, swimming, but also things like singing or dancing and storytelling. It is Ireland after all. All these kind of things were part of a competition to see who was the best in Ireland. Multiple artists in different crafts like goldsmiths, like weavers or jewelers, they all competed to see who could claim to be the best of Ireland. And you could get so much prestige out of this, not only for yourself if you want, but for your closest family and tribe. Now, of course, remember that during this time, Ireland was very tribal, so it was a huge deal if you were able to get that prestige for your closest kin group. Even competitions of vigil. Uh, were held and Fidgel is the old Irish equivalent of uh, of chess. I should be pronouncing that as Fidgel if I'm not mistaken. Fidgel. As you can tell from my accent I'm not native to this country. That means I don't speak Gaelic so I'll be butchering some of these names. And all of this took place in a little town called Telltown in County Meath. This is on the east coast of Ireland and Telltown is the, the anglicized name of Teltin, of the Irish Teltin. So, dates. When? Let's, let's first date this inside of a year itself. Like I said, this was a harvest festival. So for about a fortnight prior to August 1st, these games were held. And then they culminated up into the most important day, which was August 1st, or Lunasa. This Lunasa is one of the four main festivals in the Celtic calendar, together with Imbolc, Beltane or Bealtaine, and Samhain. The ancient Irish, they were a sun-worshipping people, so they had a solar cult, if you will. And this is what many of their ancient megalithic structures, like Newgrange, they were built in alignment on these major solar events, like, for example, the winter solstice, the spring equinox, the summer solstice, and the autumn equinox. And these were hugely important in their megalithic buildings. So the solar year was further divided to mark the halfway point between the major solar events, giving the so-called cross-quarter days, and those are Imbolc, Beltane, Lunasa, and Samhain. And we'll see the importance of the sun come back later in our story. And then where do we date this in time, in history? Now this is where it gets tricky. A lot of different dates are thrown around when you go and look into the origin of the Teltian Games. Uh, 1829 BC, 1600 BC, these are dates that I've seen. Uh, others dated to a little bit younger, so 632 BC, 539 BC. Honestly, we're not quite sure how old the Teltian Games actually are. So to answer the question, the Olympics, who did it first, the Greeks or the Irish? 
it really depends on which starting date you want to pick for the Irish Games. The Greeks are pretty well established. I think they date their first Olympics to 776 or 776 BC. That is a date given by Aristotle, as far as I remember my Greek history, and that is pretty widely accepted. So let's say that you take the conservative date uh, for the Irish Games, then it's younger, but only slightly. But if you take the older dates, it's older. And not just a bit, but much, much older. And a lot of Irish folklorists and historians tend to weigh heavily towards the older dates, not just because of the extra prestige that this gives as being the first of having some kind of an Olympic event, but just because the Irish Telchin games are such an integral part of ancient Irish identity that it goes back way, way back into the mists of time, probably all the way into the Bronze Age. So to conclude, we're not quite sure, but it very well could be that the Telchin games are older than the Olympics. So yes, the Irish could very well have done it first. As you can tell from these very specific dates, the ancient Irish were incredibly particular about dating their deep history. Their traditional history actually goes back to about 3000 BC. In the old world, that is among the oldest traditional histories that we have. Only the Egyptians to about 3100 BC for the first dynasty, and the Jews to about 3760 BC. Only those two civilizations have histories, oral traditions that go back later than the Irish, which is quite something. So you've heard me referencing these games on the two different names, the Telchin games and the Lunasa games. Both names refer to Irish gods being Telchu and Lu. We'll go back into both of them. So the games were said to have started by the god Lu in honor and remembrance of his foster mother, Telchu. Now, Telchu is a very interesting figure. She's a sovereignty and fertility goddess connected to the harvest and known to have cleared many forests to make the land ready for agriculture. The area around Meath, where all of this is said to have happened, is some of Ireland's best farmlands. Telchu died of exhaustion, clearing the plains of Ireland to make the land available for farming, and on her deathbed, she asked that the funeral games would be held in her memory. And this is then honored by Lou, who also takes part in these first games. So originally, these were funeral games. I wouldn't do Tail to justice if I just left it at that. She's far more interesting than that. So she was the wife of the last Fear Bog King of Ireland called Ichid McGurk, and also the foster mother of the Tuadidanu god Lu. Now, Ichid McGurk was slain during the Battle of Moitura on the plains of Kong in County Mayo between the Fear Bog and the invading Tuadidana. And this is usually dated in Irish folklore to about 1896 BC. Again, this very peculiar specificity with dates in ancient Irish history. However, Teilchu survived the battle and remarried. She was supposedly the daughter of a king of Spain called Magmor, and this theme of reaching back to Spain comes back again and again in Irish local myths. But in some legends, she's also the daughter of the earth, Magmor being Great Plain, so the daughter of the Great Plain. She was said to be enormously learned, master of all crafts. She had the reputation of being the most distinguished druidess in the Western world. And this is where it gets interesting. So she survived the war with the two other Danim, and she remarried. She became the foster mother of Lu and passed all of that knowledge down to Lu. And Lu becomes known as the Master Olive or Master of All Crafts. So he got all of his knowledge according to one legend from his foster mother, tells you. There are so many details to this story that can function as small little windows into ancient Irish culture. For example, the importance of fosterage as a way to strengthen social bonds. I'm also thinking of the clearing of the land that comes back so often in ancient Irish literature. They were absolutely obsessed with explaining why the country looks the way that it does. 
And then this strange connection to Spain with King Macmore. The connection with Spain comes back again and again, both on national level and on a local level. With the national level, I'm thinking about the origin story of Ireland, which talks about the different waves of invaders. And the last tribe to take Ireland from the aforementioned Tuatadanan were the Milesians, who supposedly came from Spain. And in the stories, these Milesians turn out to be the Gaels or the modern Irish. And on a local level, I'm thinking about Princess Berra, after whom the Berra Peninsula is named. She was also an, a Spanish princess. So there are many of these little connections that you can make from this one story. Look at this. This is just fantastic. So we're making this quick little stop at a holy well. Now, during the penal times, the Catholics in Ireland were completely forbidden to gather in mass uh, to, to worship. However, they found a way around this by going out into the countryside and by um, gathering at so-called uh, called mass rocks, or in this case, old holy wells. When the penal times were cancelled later on, these holy wells were still being used for pilgrimages, for doing the rounds, and some of them are still in use. Like this one here where you can see little offerings, usually for healing of loved ones. Honestly, these things go back way into the deep past, far beyond Christian times. Holy wells in Ireland are connected to the Iron Age, to the Bronze Age. We actually don't know how old they are. This deep, deep connection with nature, with the landscape, that is Irish culture. And it got integrated in its expression of Christianity. So I hope you enjoyed that little intermezzo. Let's keep on going. By the way, if you're getting some value out of this video, do me a solid and you can give me one of these of uh, a thumbs up. Now stick around to the end of the video because then we'll be going into if the ancient Greeks actually got their idea for the Olympics from the ancient Irish games. And I can tell you already there are some interesting details there, uh, some interesting arguments. But first, if we're just meeting for the first time, my name is Niels. On this channel we go into the history, the mystery and the beauty of Ireland for those people who want to travel this beautiful country. So let's take a look at Lou. Now he's one of the most important two other Danan gods. He's a central hero of the mythological cycle of Irish myths and he's also one of the three major Irish heroes together with Fionn McCool and Cúchollan uh, who, who both were said to have partaken in the games at some point in time too. Finn to find warriors for his Fianna warrior band and Cúchollan was said to be fathered by Lou himself. So he's also got a very cool nickname, Lou of the Longhand, and this points to his ability with the spear and his prowess in throwing it a great distance. As mentioned, he was also master of many arts. He was the original Olive Aaron, or Grand Master of the Arts and Sciences. And in that capacity, he actually is said to have invented Irish chess or fichel, which, as we saw, was also played during the games. County Louth seems to be named after him, but he also comes back as a god of light on mainland Europe. So he's a real pan-Celtic god beyond just Ireland. Places like Lyon in France and even Leipzig or more correctly nearby Lugdunum Batavorum in the Netherlands, they may retrace their name to it. Longtime supporter of the channel, Martin Jesse, is actually an archaeologist out of Leiden. And I'm sure that he'll be able to add some interesting details about Lugdunum Batavorum in the comments. Buddy, you're up. And the last little interesting tidbit here is that the whole month of August in Irish is called Lunasa after the Harvest Festival. And that word, Lunasa, is a portmanteau or a combination between Lu and Nasat or assembly. I've also seen it as a combination between Lu and Nosat or funeral rites, which would make sense. Now the Telchian games were not a standalone event. They were part of a far larger festival that celebrated the harvest and where bonds were strengthened and contracts were made for the upcoming year. It was always convened by the High King of Ireland and during the festival there was a truce proclaimed with very heavy penalties if someone broke the truce. So to give you a quick overview of what that festival, that larger festival looked like, uh, part one was the honoring of the dead. This was done with songs and mourning chants and funeral pyres. It lasted about one to three days, really depending on the status or rank of the dead. As the fires were lit, 
it is said that the assembled masses actually turn towards the setting sun in the west and raise their hands as part of the ritual. Like I said, this seems to have been a sun-worshipping culture at the time. Now, the second part, uh, after those first one to three days, was the reciting of new laws, so on day four. It was opened again by the High King, in this case facing and saluting the rising sun to the east, and then the Chief Olive or Archdruid caught forth the royal truce holding all hostilities and then the latest laws of the lands were shared. And these laws were just repeated over and over again uh, by the lesser olives, uh, so those men of learning, the poets, throughout the crowds until all knew the new laws. By the way, this position of olive at courts uh, survived in Ireland until the end of the 16th century. And then at the end of day four, there was another great pyre. And then finally the third part uh, from day five onwards there were the uh, the games themselves and there was also a huge fair let's talk about the decline of the games they were particularly popular during the 6th to the 9th century AD uh, the annals of the four masters make mention that for some reason the games were not held in the year 873 AD but all of the other years they were all the way up to 1168 with King Roderick O'Connor. And then the invasion of the Anglo-Normans happens under Henry II. After that invasion, the game started to decline very quickly. Uh, the fair, the Telstein Fair, was still held up to the late 1700s, early 1800s. Remnants of the Telstein games were apparently stopped by the clergy in the 1800s because of the violent combination between whiskey and sporting competition. Uh, but again, by that time, it, it was was a pale comparison to what it used to be, just a shadow of what it used to be. If you want to find out more about Henry II's invasion into Ireland, I did a short video about that. You can check it right about here. Before we look into the interesting idea that the Greeks might have gotten their idea about the Olympics from the Irish Telchian Games, let's first finish up the festival with the Telltown marriage. Now, I would be remiss not mentioning this one. This was a, a marriage for a year and a day, a sort of a test marriage for a couple. And then after a year and a day, if the couple said, you know what, this is not working, we are not a good match, they could break the marriage by climbing a small hill during the festival and at the top, they give the salutations to the rising sun in the east. Again, that connection with the sun comes back. And then they turned their back to each other and they walked away, one to the north and one to the south. And in that way, their marriage was null and void. No harm, no foul, and it wouldn't be held against their reputation. Like we said, there is a good chance that the Irish Games are older than the Olympics. We're not quite sure. When you investigate the games, you quickly come across the idea that the Greeks got influenced by and drew their inspiration from the ancient Irish for their Olympics. Now, let me lay out the four most compelling arguments for this. First, the Greeks were known to be part of the Telchian Fair. We've got ancient records about the fair and other fairs in Ireland that specifically mention the Greeks by name, as traders sharing their goods in these massive gatherings. So it seems that at the very least, there's a good chance that they were aware of the Irish Games. Second are the bylaws that were upheld during the Irish Games. For example, the truce that we mentioned. This meant that blood feuds were interrupted, known criminals were excluded from the games, and fights were absolutely forbidden. It was a heavy penalty if you broke this truce. Interestingly enough, these kinds of bylaws are almost exactly the same as those of the Olympics. A counter argument here would be that for the bylaws of the Olympics, uh, it's mentioned that women were not allowed, they were strictly forbidden, but for the Irish games, they were part of the whole thing. Stark contrast. And third, both the Olympics and the Irish Games were held in honor of important gods. In the case of the Olympics, it was Zeus, and as we saw in Ireland, it was in honor of Telchu. And fourth, Ireland is actually mentioned in the origin myths of the Olympics, or better yet, Hyperborea is, which sometimes is connected to Ireland. So the story goes that Heracles, in honor of Zeus, 
wanted to adorn the grounds of the sacred games with sacred trees, being olive trees. And he traveled to the mythical utopian land of Hyperborea to get these beautiful trees. And this is where it gets interesting. In the Celtic revival craze, Ireland was often connected to Hyperborea, either being the mythical utopia or being somehow the descendants of or part of the larger landmass of Hyperborea. That is another reason why uh, people think that maybe the Greeks got the idea for the Olympics from the Irish. Now, do I believe this? No. But you will come across this when you are investigating the Teltian Games. So I thought to mention it. The main thing that I'm getting from all of this is that the Teltian Games were so important and had such a cultural influence that they were known far and wide, far beyond Ireland itself. And that during the Iron Age or perhaps even the Bronze Age. And that it had such a cultural impact that it was known on mainland Europe. Now that to me is just fascinating. Final point that I'd like to make here is that it's said that Lou made the games in honor of Telchu, but also to exhibit Irish strength and Irish culture as a celebration of Irish culture. And we've all seen the horrors of nationalism over the past few centuries, but it can also highlight what your culture is fantastic at. I'm going to quote Rabbi Warpy here. He said something akin to, it's not your job to argue what your culture is superior at, but rather what is your culture exceptional in. And to me, the Telchian games show what ancient Irish culture was absolutely exceptional at and knowing about it makes your trip to this country that much more rich and interesting. Things like that. See you guys in the next one.